I'm sure you know at least one Bart. Maybe you've even used one, but you're not proud of it because you don't know what you're doing. Well, thankfully, in this episode, we'll go to the roots of regression trees. Oh yeah, that's what BART stands for. What were you thinking about? Our tree expert will be no one else than Samir Deshpande. Samir is an assistant professor of statistics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to that, he completed a postdoc at MIT and earned his PhD in statistics from UPenn. On the methodological front, he is interested in Bayesian hierarchical modeling, regression trees, model selection, and causal inference. That sounds like fun, right? Of course, we'll talk about that. And these are topics we talk a lot on this podcast, so I hope you're as excited as I am. Much of Samir's applied work is motivated by an interest in understanding the long-term health consequences of playing American-style tackle football. He also enjoys modeling sports data and was a finalist, actually, in the 2019, you remember that pre-COVID world, the 2019 NFL Big Data Bowl. Outside of statistics, he enjoys cooking, making cocktails, and photography. Sometimes doing all of those at the same time. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 80, recorded March 8, 2023. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. For any info about the podcast, learnbasedstats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasedstats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.endora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbasedstats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. hello my dear Bayesians. once again i am very happy to welcome yet another member in our lbs patreon community this time i am talking about the mysterious arcady Thank you so much, Arkady. I'm super grateful for your support. It helps me for editing, for a lot of things that you folks don't see that go into making an episode. And I am really looking forward to talking to you in the LBS Slack channel. Okay, now let's talk with Samir. Samir Deshpande, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot for taking the time. I think Listeners will be happy, in particular my patrons, because they have been asking for you to come on the show for a while now. So finally, we made it happen. So I'm personally very happy because we're going to talk about regression trees and topics that we haven't covered a lot yet on the podcast. But also I'm happy because I'm making patrons happy. So thank you, folks. Ah, excellent. Thanks to them, too. So before talking about bards, though, let's start with your origin story, as usual. How do you come to the stats in data world, Samir, and how sinuous of a path that was? In some sense, it was actually a pretty straight path. I think like a lot of folks, you know, I got into statistics through kind of experience in mathematics. And I grew up in Texas. And at the time that I was growing up there, it was a really nice place to be as a student interested in math. You know, we had kind of math competitions, the Olympiads and, and related things. And there was a really strong community of high school students interested in math contests in, in Texas at the time. And one of the things that was kind of a lot of fun when I was growing up was there was a, a university down in South Texas, a Texas State University. 
that would host like a six to eight week math camp every summer. And so I used to go to that every summer, basically from the middle of my second, like all through secondary education. And as part of that, I, I remember once working on a kind of research project there, which involved some statistics. And this was the first time that I'd ever seen statistics. I had never taken a class on statistics, but it was some sort of data analysis. And, and I got, you know, that this sort of bug I was like, you know, that was a lot of fun. I get to use a lot of the mathematical thinking, a lot of problem solving and answer kind of a substantive question. And so when I went on to university, I had kind of already decided, you know, hey, I kind of want to do statistics, I kind of want to go to graduate school. And so I kind of went on a straight line journey through undergrad on what do I need to do to kind of go to statistics graduates programs. I jumped straight to my graduate program straight from undergrad and, and I'm still here, which is exciting. Yeah, so like you developed an interest for math and scientific thinking really Really fast. Yeah, it all kind of worked out. I didn't have a lot of, I, I don't have a very circuitous path. I, I kind of liked the problem solving aspect uh, uh -huh. that statistics somehow inherently has. You know, we are trying to think creatively about, you know, what is the data, what is sort of the story in the data, yeah. the, putting too fine a point on it. So that's something that kind of appealed to that kind of like problem solving, kind of lizard brain side of me. And it's what I still get a lot of joy out of. Yeah, I can see uh, why the Bayesian framework then would be interesting for you. <laughs> We're definitely going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I can, and I can also understand that you get that kind of like, you know, murder mystery solving things all the time with research and with statistics in particular. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I still have a lot of fun doing statistics still. And it's, 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 yeah. it's, I think, a real important part of a part of my career. Yeah, for sure. Where did you go? Where did you study before your undergraduates? So like until high school, did you study in the US or? I was in Texas. I was, I went to school in outside the Dallas area. And yeah, I went to kind of a specialized school for math and science in my last two years. So I was kind of in and around universities and in and around academia, basically, from the time I was like 15 or 16. And I'm curious, actually, because in France, for instance, you would not learn about the scientific method of inquiry before you start doing a PhD, basically, or even like, yeah, a bit in master's. Yeah, in master's, let's say in master's degree. And I'm surprised by that, you know, because like to me now, uh, science is, is so much related to the method. Actually, it's not just, you know, theorems that just appeared from nowhere or, oh, yeah, we know that gravity works that way because it's like, like, it's like inventing a theorem or discovering it. But it's actually coming from a method and like all that murder mystery method that we were talking about before, which is actually inherent in the statistical work. And I find that a shame because that would have been awesome to be introduced to that method before, because maybe I would have gone into research. I don't know, but, and I'm guessing that some, some students don't go into research because they don't know about that. And they think, oh, I'm not good enough at math, math to you know, invent theorems or algorithms. Whereas actually science is, isn't really about that. I want to push on that point just a little bit. So I, I sort of find all of them, like constitutionally, I believe that everybody can do math. It's and statistics. I, I really reject the kind of, this is not for everybody. Or like I, I, when I even see it, I'm like some of my students that I'm teaching now, somebody will say, you know, I, I'm not really a statistics type of person. It's, it's really, they don't, they don't see themselves in the field. And, and so this is something that I actually think a lot about and, and how do we fix this um, from a pedagogical perspective? Yeah. I could tell a story about how I think Bayes is, is, is really taps into some creativity and, and we, we really need to get away from kind of procedural thinking, but maybe that's for later in the podcast. Uh, that was a long <laughs> preamble to my question, but yeah, that was basically, did you get introduced to, when did you get introduced to that, you know, kind of method? And also, yeah, like personally, what do you do as a teacher also to handle that pedagogically? Because I find that also quite hard because it's like such an ingrained idea that, oh yeah, but you have to be a math person to do that kind of thing. So my own journey into Bayes, I think starts once I got to graduate school. So. I trained, my undergraduate training was at MIT and, and it was at a time when there was really not a lot of statistical activity happening on campus. There would be a couple of classes in the math department, a few classes in the business school, 
a few scattered around the university, but this was sort of a little bit before they got really organized around sort of data and data science and, and information and, and really got into this. And, and so I was just kind of, I had a very sort of narrow view of statistics. It was only, only what I saw through, through the courses I took. Once I got to graduate school in my first year, I came into graduate school really wanting to do like asymptotic theory, these sort of like two point arguments, minimaxity. That's what I thought I really wanted to do. And as I started taking my core sequence in my first year, I took an applied base class that was taught by, by Shane Jensen. So I really owe Shane a lot in some sense, my entire career. So thank you, Shane, if, if you're listening. <laughs> but, you know, I took his applied sort of Bayesian modeling class and I was just totally hooked. I thought hierarchical models and sharing of information and how you can leverage information from one group structurally to inform estimation in another group. I just found that totally fascinating. And I started working with Shane on some analysis of some basketball data where it actually was pretty useful to, to take a Bayesian perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of working along these two tracks early in, in graduate school. I was reading all of these sort of theoretical papers, and then I was going back to my office and working on some really applied analyses. And after a while, I realized I kind of like this Bayesian stuff a lot more than I like, you know, trying to chase bounds and, and that and sort of like it, it kind of is a personal preference. Mm. And it's sort of grown from there. I've gotten much more interested in methods and, you know, thinking about creative ways to, to solve interesting problems from the Bayesian perspective. So maybe the, the short answer is, I just started doing some applied data analysis. Bayes was super useful. It tapped into kind of things that I thought were very intuitive. I liked the flexibility and the creativity that was afforded by, you know, you in some sense get to write down whatever prior you want. You can structure your model however you you please. Whether you can compute with it is, is another issue. And, and, and I think there's a lot of fun in, in exploring that tension. Yeah, for sure. And what are you teaching actually? So currently here at Wisconsin, I've been teaching our graduate base class. Um, I've taught that a couple of times and I've taught a Bayesian class at the undergraduate level. And now I'm currently teaching our kind of undergraduate regression. So very non bayes And so I'm kind of relearning what a, you know, a confidence interval is, and how to express it and telling people it's not the probability that your parameter lives in an interval, you know, the, the, the usual things. And so I've, I've as much as I enjoy the Bayesian paradigm, I do appreciate having to teach outside of it from time to time. Well, I'm curious, have you already taught some some Bayesian classes? I have, yes. Okay. And so, yeah, I'm curious what what were the main difficulties for for your student students when when learning the, the Bayesian framework actually? Our graduate course is situated as kind of something that our students will take after they've seen a lot of kind of mathematical statistics and, and inference. And so they, most of the students have already come in having seen a bit of decision theory. They've seen unbiased estimation, minimum variance estimation. They've seen mixed models from a kind of like linear mixed models or like a LME4 style computation. And, and so one of the big challenges early on for me was how do I convince these students that they need another form of statistical thinking. Like, why do we need another paradigm? And what I really wanted to avoid was getting bogged down by any one topic. You know, you could teach a semester-long graduate sequence on, or probably a year-long sequence or more on, on just MCMC. But I think if you focus too much on, on computation, you lose, you have to lose and you know, model building and model criticism. I think what Andrew Gelman and, and colleagues would call the, the, the Bayesian workflow, which I find extremely compelling. So I tried to cover a bit of that. I tried to introduce my students to Stan. I tried not to make them, you know, hand derive a whole bunch of samplers because for many of them, this would have been their only Bayesian course. And so I would say that my students probably found it to be a bit of like drinking from a fire hose. Um, I was throwing a lot at them. But I think some of them really did come around to being open to thinking about a, the Bayesian paradigm. Or, and I think many of them realized that, you know, in their own consulting work or their own applied work, that they might actually use some of these ideas. And so I consider that a success. But uh, maybe if my students were overhearing this, maybe they'd have other opinions. But that might be for another time. Yeah, it's quite hard 
especially I find it even harder to introduce the Bayesian framework when people have been working a long time in the frequencies framework and they are not looking for something else. If they are looking for something else, they already know they need something else because they have a problem they cannot work on with their classic tools. Otherwise, I find it extremely hard to convince them in a way. And it's especially related to the idea of objectivity, you know, where it's like, sometimes I kind of feel like, you know, that guy in the matrix, which is, who is saying like, yeah, but objectivity doesn't exist actually. <laughs> so it's like, so you can use base. That's me like, in class. Yeah, exactly. It's like, so take that red pill and I'll show you what the lo world looks like once you accept that objectivity doesn't exist or, well, just then take the blue pill and continue doing what you're doing. Sure, it works sure. for a lot of things, but there are some cases where it will not work, but that's that's okay. No, it's, it's interesting you say that. Until you accept the fact that objectivity doesn't exist, I cannot really do anything for you except yeah, showing you that there are other methods, but if you don't really understand that mm, preamble, it's going to be very hard. I take a somewhat less poetic approach to this. And, and I say it a, a lot of times that I feel that as a field, we probably are better at acknowledging like just how much of what we're doing is just kind of entirely made up. Mm -hmm. You know, statistics is a lot of, is, is I think much more vibes than anything else. You know, you write down a model, like if it seems to work and if it gives you a good answer, who am I to judge it? I fully embrace subjectivity. And I try to get my students to think less procedurally. Like you see this type of data, you must use this link in a GL lab. And if you see that type of data, you must do this. And you must always use, you know, clustered standard errors or robust standard errors, sort of without, with, like uncritically. I think, yeah, so I, I, I'm with you that objectivity to me is, is doesn't exist. Everything is subjective. And it's whether I can convince you that my analysis and the story that I'm telling based on my data is, is compelling. Yeah, well, I'm thinking a lot about these things right now because, yeah, I'm teaching a workshop and like it's, it's oh, a bit like, that, like people are coming from the frequency framework. So it's really interesting for, for me from a pedagogical standpoint. Yeah. But anyways, like let's continue. I could make the whole episode with that, but we've already talked about that or uh, on the, on the podcast. If folks are curious about that, I would recommend episode 50 with David Spiegel Halter, who goes as far as saying that probability doesn't even exist. So if that sounds interesting, listen to that, folks. The old Dave Finetti line. Exactly. And then episode 51 with Aubrey Clayton, who wrote the book Bernoulli's Fallacy and the Crisis of Modern Science. So really interesting book also and, and episode. So I'll, I'll put those two episodes in the show notes. Well, basically, like, these are whole episodes about these more epistemological topics that I love. So of course I sprinkled a bit of it with you right now, but I also want to talk about some statistical methods. Yeah. And actually before digging to that, can you just define for us the work you're doing nowadays and the topics that you are particularly focusing on and interested in? I'm kind of in some sense all over the place in terms of what I'm working on. I would say currently I spend maybe 40 to 60% of my time really thinking about treat models and, and like developing BART and trying to make it more flexible and deploying it in different places and slapping BARTs into different different parts of various probabilistic models. And, and I really just enjoy kind of working in that space. About 10 to 20% of my time is also spent on something slightly more classical. This is some work on sparsity and model selection with like spike and slap priors. In my training, I, I encountered the spike and slap lasso and kind of EM-like algorithms for, for getting map estimation. And um, with some students, we're thinking about how do we get good uncertainty quantification out of these posteriors, which are you know, geometrically a nightmare, very spiky and multimodal and, and hard to explore. So I, I like thinking about those. And, and then the rest of it is, is sort of applied projects and various collaborations. I, I'd say... A lot of my collaborations are centered around kind of understanding how effects like playing sports in, in adolescence might affect your health later in life. And, and here you have to think about how does an effect change over time? How does it vary across a population? How do I estimate these things in a super flexible way? 
And so that kind of leads to a lot of things about what I want to do in, in terms of BART and what like the direction of like the methodological development is all sort of roughly answering this question of how do effects change over time and how can it be as flexible as possible in, in modeling this? Yeah, it's definitely super interesting. Yeah, we can we can talk about that those uh, specific sure, examples absolutely. later on because I, I'm curious, like, especially about the last one. Yeah, but like how does sport impact? your like health outcomes later on in life. Mm -hmm. But first, so as you said, yeah, you work on a lot of topics, but one of them in particular, we haven't treated in depth on that podcast yet. And that's BART. So Bayesian additive regression trees. That's what you meant by working on tree models, by the way, in case listeners got confused and thought you were working about forests and trees and things like that. Maybe you are, but that's what you, what you meant. <laughs> so yeah, can you tell us what BARTs are to begin with? BART, or Herbation Additive Regression Trees, is a model that was initially proposed by, by, by Chipman, George, and McCulloch in, in this wonderful 2010 paper. And then it grows out of a much larger program that, that started off, I think, with with the three of them really thinking about what does a Bayesian cart model look like? So you, you have some Ys, you have some Xs, and a very flexible way to, to kind of model the mapping from X to Y is with a classification and regression tree. You know, like the C4-5 algorithm or cart or R part, all of these, you know, decision trees are, are sort of a nice topic. And I believe that they were really looking for a kind of a Bayesian flavor to this. And so the idea is, can I learn a decision tree or a, like a regression tree that approximates my data well or like models my data well, you can write down a prior for trees and now you can turn the patient crank and, and they would try to get a posterior distribution over trees. And what they found was that the results were maybe not as nice as they would have hoped. What they found was their MCMC would get bogged down around really deep trees and you'd not really explore the space of regression trees very well. And so about 10 years after that first Bayesian cart paper, they introduced the BART model, which, which is a forest model. It is saying that you've got some Xs and you've got some Ys, and you believe that the Ys are you know, noisy observations of a function evaluated at the Xs. And what BART does is it says, let's try to approximate this function using a sum of binary regression trees. So it'll say, find an ensemble of like 200 trees that when you add them together, you get a good approximation of this regression function. And so in a way, it feels kind of like a random forest or like a gradient boosting tree ensemble in that you're using a bunch of weak learners. You, you don't want any one tree in the ensemble to explain too much variation in your outputs. But when you add them up together, you get, you get something really nice. I will stipulate that BART is not a Bayesian version of random forests. It is... It is very different. Um, there is no kind of subsampling involved. It is similar in the sense that there is a ensemble of regression trees, but the kind of operating sort of the way we do inference, the way it kind of works is is very different. So it's it's much closer in spirit to boosting than it is to random forests. And and, and this is a perception that I think a lot of people have developed. Out. It's like Bayesian random forests. It's it's anything but. Huh, okay. So, but would you like? Is that different from random forest because the way it's calculated or also because you would not use them on the same kind of models or problems? That's a great question. I think they're trained in fundamentally different way. You use all of the data to train all of the trees. There the is Bayesian some trees. similarity in BART. Yeah, in the, in the Bayesian, in BART. All of the data informs all of the trees. They're not independent. Whereas in random forest, how does that go? Random forest, right? You'll you'll sort of subsample some of your data to to train. This is sort of bootstrap aggregation. Okay, I see. Oh, okay, yeah. And you don't use all of the predictors, but it is a different algorithm. The trees are not done sequentially. They're kind of learned together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and much so more Bayesian. Highly dependent. Um, yeah, it's yeah, much yeah. more Bayesian in a way. Yeah. But what I will say, and and maybe this is worth pointing out. That another perspective one can take about what BART is actually trying to do, it's helpful to think about piecewise constant step functions. So a regression tree is, in some sense, a piecewise constant function. Given an arbitrary space, it doesn't have to be Euclidean space. 
It could be any sort of space in some sense. Mm -hmm. You can write down a, a you, if you can recursively partition uh, this space, you know, given a space, randomly break it into two pieces, then go into each of those spaces, randomly break them. If you just continue this, you can arrange all of them kind of hierarchically into a tree, you know, the first break, and then you subsequently break each piece. And then if you just put a, an output at the bottom of each tree, that defines a piecewise constant function over, over your space. And what BART's doing is it's saying, I want to approximate some complicated function using a large collection of relatively simple piecewise constant functions. And at first, this might sound kind of bizarre, like what if the function is smooth? What if it's really structured? Why would you use piecewise constant functions? But it's important to note that piecewise constant set functions are a universal function approximator. With enough of them, you can approximate damn near anything. And so what Bart is trying to do in some sense is it's trying to learn a collection of step functions that when added together gives you a good approximation to the regression function you're after. And because there's uncertainty about which functions you should use, you can write down a prior over them, you can turn the Bayesian crank, you can get a posterior, and you'd hope that the posterior distribution places most of its probability on the sort of individual step functions that when added together give you a good approximation. And so that's, I think, the way that I like to understand BART the tree is just a computationally efficient way of representing a step function. Yeah. It's kind of, a, let's approximate a function using a bunch of weak learners that happen to be well uh, well represented by, by trees. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. That sounds really clear to me. I love that. And you managed to uh, basically put it down to the like smallest building blocks of BART. And basically the idea of BART is a bit that, right? It's like finding the fundam the most fundamental particles in which you can disintegrate the model and then trying to build a model based on add the adding all of those particles together. And one of the nice things is that this idea that let's learn a fun so 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 there's a philosophical reason to like BART, but I think a much better reason is is practical. You know, Hugh, Ed and, and Rob really came up with a way in that 2010 paper to make this work well. And what I mean by that is if you want to do non-parametric regression, if you can run a BART, it, it's enough to basically, you know, an R to call something like BART XY or something. You don't have to do a ton of hyperparameter tuning. There's not a lot of, you know, internal cross-validation to, to get the model to run just right. It works off the shelf pretty well. And so it makes it really easy for practitioners who are like, I just need to run a regression. I don't want to think too hard about the functional form. I just want to get really accurate predictions and reasonably well calibrated uncertainty quantification, but I don't want to kind of specify a parametric form. And I don't want to say, you know, the function depends on x1 and x2 and like x3 squared times the sine of x4. Like, who the hell is going to get that specification right? So it works without having to do a lot of pre specification and it works with some default parameter values. But they came up with ways to set the prior hyperparameters that they sacrifice a little bit of Bayesian coherence, but it works astonishingly well. And it, I think, is really what makes BART a compelling model, that the, the availability of good default settings that work well across problems is why I think it's found so much use in, in applications and why it's you know, really popular for you know, causal inference now. It's at some point you have to do a regression. You don't want to think too hard about what that regression function looks like, but you want to use that regression function downstream, or it's a great way of, of doing that. And you get all the bells and whistles from yeah, you modeling, get all your which is like yeah, uncertainty, yeah. quantification, and then you've got posterior samples. So you can ask any question from those posterior samples, including doing decision-making optimization and stuff like that. Exactly. Now, I will, I will make one small caveat relative to kind of our traditional like parametric models, you know, the things we might fit really well with HMC or, or in STAN or in, in any number of languages now, you know, there we, we think a lot about like, you know, convergence diagnostics. Is my MCMC mixing? And here's the honest truth about BART. It doesn't mix. It has in some sense no hope of mixing over tree space. These trees are not identified. So you're working with this like very complicated representation that isn't identified sums of trees aren't identified. It's a really curious thing that it works as well as it does, despite us knowing that, you know, 
however long you've run your MCMC for, however many chains you've run it for, it probably hasn't mixed in a meaningful sense. And yet, the posterior, if we just close our eyes and compute posterior means and close our eyes and, and compute intervals, it tends to work pretty well. And I think that's actually, you know, exciting that, like, by rights, this thing shouldn't work as well as it does. And yet we have a decade of sort of empirical evidence that, you know, you actually get some good answers out of it. Okay. And I know there's, there's some folks currently working on sort of thinking hard about the theory about, you know, like mixing and BART. And it's a lovely paper and I, I really, really like it. I can send it to you and throw it in the notes. Yeah, for sure. It's really rich. I think it's, you know, these things that we would normally say, you know, if you're running a stand model and you say, oh man, it hasn't converged yet. Let me just throw some more iterations or redesign the model or reparameterize to, to, to get it to, to, to work more efficiently. With art, it's just sort of, I think it's just a fascinating research question. Why does it work as well as it does, even though all of our conventional diagnostics suggest that this shouldn't, this shouldn't be doing good things? So I find that like a very interesting space to live. For sure. Yeah, so definitely um, do add that paper to the show notes in the question file that I shared with you. There, there are the show notes at the end. So uh, yeah, definitely add that paper. And also the original paper from 2010 about, about Bart. Yeah, of course. That, that would be perfect. I think listeners are going to be interested in that. And yeah, like the what I found... Oh yeah, so one thing before seeing that. In the PyMC world, uh, someone who is thinking about a lot of that is Osvaldo Martin. He's working a lot on Bart's. And so... He's working on actually, well, enabling people using Bayesian regression trees in PyMC. So if you oh, folks are cool. interested in that, that was episode 58 where Osvaldo was here and he talked about, the, uh, about that a bit. And also I encourage you to take a look at his book with Junpeng Lao and Ravin Kumar, which is Bayesian Modeling and Computation in Python. I've put the, these two links in the show notes already. If you're interested in that, there is a whole chapter about BARTs in the book. And so, yeah, if you want to do BARTs in Python, that's definitely a good starting point. And if you're interested in contributing, well, then reach out to me or Osvaldo. Definitely, he'll welcome people working on BART in Python with him. Yeah, that, so talking about BARTs, what, what I found interesting also is that it kind of reminds me of Fourier transform. You know, it's like, it's super weird where it's like, you, why adding sine and cosine would give you, you know, like any basically time series behavior. It's so weird, but it sounds kind of like the same, the same idea. And also it reminds me of splines. There are some pretty deep connections there, you know. So yeah, maybe can you talk about that? Because it sounds to me like parts are kind of like discrete splines. So yeah, can you talk a bit about these relationships? I would say that there's a probably a nice, it, it's not a direct analog um, by any stretch. You can view the trees in some sense as define, and, and I think this is really in the spirit of kind of the more classical regression trees or or sort of the, or, or the Mars, Friedman's Mars method, I, I think, the, what it was, the multivariate adaptive splines, I think is, a, you can, somebody can look that up later, but that is saying that, you know, the tree defines kind of an adaptive basis. And at some level, you're decomposing a function into a data adaptive basis. And insofar as lines can kind of do this, a similar thing, they're somewhat less adaptive, you can draw a parallel there. But I think there is a connection to like the Haar wavelet basis, you know, where you're, you, you take an interval and you bipartition partition it, and then you further partition it into this like very, you know, discrete thing. I think that's the hard wavelet basis. Let me just double check here. Yeah, it, it's where you you kind of take an interval, cut it in half, then take the, those intervals, cut them in half again. That's in some sense, Bart is doing something like that, but it's somewhat less rigid than that basis. Mm -hmm. But I think there are kind of ways to get some insight into what Bart's doing is thinking about it as kind of similar to a specific type of wavelet mm -hmm. decomposition. But we're, you know, we're not specifying it fully in advance. We're kind of letting the data determine at what resolution we need to, to split our, our input space at. Mm -hmm. I think there are probably some really interesting ways to draw parallels here. 
I haven't spent a lot of time kind of probing this, but I, I do think, I think there's a there there. Yeah, definitely super interesting. And that's cool that the concepts are close to each other because <laughs> it makes it easier to understand in a way, you know, like if you already know about Fourier transforms or, mm -hmm. or splines, then it's easier to understand about, about Barnes. And actually, we talked about that already. Like, so you said that it's different from random forests. And since I'm guessing that folks are familiar with random forests a bit more. So you said that it's different, not only because, so it's different because it's not doing the same thing under the hood. It's not the same algorithm, but also like, so yeah, I asked you that. And then I think we switched to something else. Is that also different because you would not use parts? for the same kind of problems that you could use random forests? I actually think you can use a BART for a much richer class of problems mm -hmm. than random forests. So BART originally got its start for non-parametric regression with you yeah. know, like Gaussian, Gaussian errors, fixed variance, your run-of-the-mill non-parametric regression problem. And insofar as the log likelihood there looks like a squared error, yeah, I mean, that looks like you know using MSE when, when training random forests for regression. But for classification, you know, with BART, you're getting the full probabilistic model. So to do BART for classification, it's easiest to do it as like a probit regression. Um, it sort of makes the, the computation a little bit easier. But then once you do that, you can start to do things like, well, what if you want heteroscedastic regression, where not only does the mean function change with X, but, but your, your sigma changes with X. Well, this is a very clever paper by, by basically the BART authors again. They said, well, you can just use a sum of trees to write to decompose the log variance as a function of x. And now we're really cooking with gas because that's something that random forests, you're going to have to really be clever about your, your loss function in a random forest to, in order to get that. But within kind of the probabilistic framework, it's, it's not that hard. You write down a likelihood, it depends on, you know, an ensemble for your mean function, an ensemble for your variance function. Those are you know, expressed as sums or products of trees. You put a prior on those trees. There's a way to do your MCMC. You can start to embed BART within larger classes of models. So if you want to do, say, a survival model, there's a way to, to do BART on that. Some of my, so some folks over at the Medical, Medical College of Wisconsin are, have really been pushing on this in some really phenomenal work, as, as are some folks down in Florida. They're writing some excellent, you know, art with survival. You can start to do, you know, log linear models. You can do smooth models. You can do some spatial modeling with BART. Like you can start putting it in. Essentially, if you can write down a probabilistic model where at some point you've got a regression function or like a function that depends on some covariates. And if you were expressing that, you know, as a linear form or in some basis, you can probably just put a BART in its place and with a bit of work, probably work out the, the necessary computation. And so you can do a lot with this really simple idea of let's just approximate a function. One of the, you know, having sat in this literature now for a couple of years and thinking really only about BART most days, there's this wonderful new paper by, by some folks at Duke on density regression in BART. And I just thought that was great. I thought it was super cool. So you can start doing all sorts of fun stuff, but to get random forests or like neural networks to do like these types of things, you got to do a lot of work in like designing like loss functions. And because you're no longer working with a full probabilistic model, it, it becomes harder to chase your uncertainties and to see really what's going on. So I... I would consider this a, apologies for rambling, this sort of a full-throated defense of probabilistic models. I see. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of sounds like it's kind of like a non-parametric regression. It definitely is. But we can do a lot more than just plain vanilla regression now. For sure. It's like, makes me think also of Gaussian processes, of course, <laughs> which are like kind of the kings of the non-parametric world. <laughs> Everything in the end is a is a Gaussian process. I'm pretty sure a black hole inside a black hole there is a Gaussian process. Like I, I, that's my bet, honestly. There's a theorem at, at at some level, and and I certainly didn't prove this, and I, I I don't know if it's been formally proven, but it kind of goes like this. In Bart, what you're doing is you have to write down this prior on on regression trees, and you know that's a fairly complicated thing to like 
try to do. You can do it implicitly by describing just how you generate them. You, you, know, you draw the tree structure, you draw the decision rules, and then you have to draw the values that the, the tree spits out as a function. Well, those values typically are, come from, like, say, a normal distribution. And you might say in the 200 trees in my ensemble, you know, each of them, when you take a single X and you evaluate the function, it just spits out in the prior just a normal random variable. So you're adding up a bunch of normals. And so now you can start to think about this and saying, well, I'm adding up a whole bunch of normals. If I take a limit and I scale it correctly, there's some like Gaussian that pops up at the end. And what it turns out, I think, is that I maybe this is informal or sort of a folk theorem, but I believe that in the infinite tree limit, art does converge to a Gaussian process with a very specific kernel. And that kernel is sort of determined by you take two points X and X prime in your input space, and you see how often would a random regression tree put X and X prime in the same partition cell. And that's sort of the notion of closeness. And, and you know, this type of... So, so there is a like kernel sitting underneath Barter. There's a kernel sort of in the limit of BART model and sort of the infinite tree limit. But my sense is that it's often much faster to just do the BART approximation rather than treat it formally as a GP. But these methods are all doing something similar. BART is just trying to figure out which Xs are most similar so I can leverage similarity in their Ys. And, and that's exactly what a kernel in your GP is doing. Hmm, you see, I told you. Everything. Everything comes back to GPs. Everything the GP in the end. I'm telling you, folks, this is the Nobel Prize winning discovery. Black holes are just GPs, which <laughs> we just don't know how to compute their their uh, covariance kernel. <laughs> cool. So yeah, thanks a lot. That makes a lot of sense. So now I have an idea of, okay, why would I use Barnes? When would I use them? So now what I would like to ask you is actually... What are the most challenging parts when you're working with bots? And when would you not use bots? Okay, I would use BART all the time. <laughs> and if it isn't easy to do it, I view that as an opportunity. So what I really mean to, to, to be, you know, not so flippant about it, you know, BART's really great in applications where you really need to get a good prediction and you want to get your uncertainties around those predictions. If you think about the old sort of two cultures type of framing of, you know, there's a black box that takes your X to your Ys, Bart's not necessarily trying to make it interpretable. It's not, it, it's just a way to go from X to Y hat in some sense, or F hat um, in, in, to be more precise. So, you know, if you really need interpretability, if you really need, you know, identify the main effect or a main driver of some process, BART will get you great predictions. It'll probably get you great fit, but it's not going to be easy to figure out is this an inter what are the interactions? And and I I say it's not easy. This is true of just about every tree model. Figuring out what is you know the most important driver. There's many ways to do this. You know, uh, partial dependence plots or or sort of important scores. And then there's like a whole cottage industry that's that's really trying to interpret sums of regression trees. It gets complicated because with sums of regression trees, you can represent the same function using many different sums. So from a likelihood standpoint, the, the trees are not identified through the likelihood. So if we're deriving things based on the tree structure, that becomes slightly problematic in my opinion. So if you really need interpretability, BART's maybe not the thing to be going for first. You could potentially run a BART and then post-process this, so, you know, like Spencer Woody and, and Carlos Carvalho and, and some of their colleagues have really pulled on this. Jared Murray's pulled on this a lot. And I really like this idea of some of, some of the folks in the space would call it fitting the fit. Mm -hmm. You run a BART, then you take the predictions from a BART, and then you train like, you know, a classification and regression tree on top of those predictions from. So mapping X to Y hat, you, you do that. So that might be a way to get interpretability. But BART out of the box is not going to be interpretable. So if you're chasing interpretability or something mechanistic, BART's maybe not the way to do it. I see. In terms of challenges, it's very easy to say, here's some fancy probabilistic model that I use, a very bespoke model, and I just want to replace a parametric form with this you know, non-parametric sum of trees. That's like very easy to say. It's very hard to do in practice because 
the software is, it's not as easy to just like plug and play a BART into any old model. Yeah. I know that there are packages like, you know, DBARTS tries to do this and it, and it does so pretty well. I enjoy using that package. But I would say for the most part, a lot of the advances in BART are people kind of writing their own, their own R packages or, or writing their own C++ code to implement a very specific BART model that does one or two things. And something that as a community that I think we can do a lot better is write more extensible and better documented source code. Mm -hmm. I do believe that if you want high performance BART models that scale and really are efficient, you really do need to be writing it in, in a lower level language and taking advantage of you know, a lot of the class structure. And something that I've been trying to do in my own work is write new extensions of BART in ways that are easy for other people to use. I'm hoping that that's what my source code is, but maybe the proof will be sort of in eating that pudding. So we'll, we'll see about that. But I think the biggest barrier is implementation. Yeah. I love the idea of, you know, having a very portable, like you write down a probabilistic model and, and just here's a little BART module that you can slap in there. I worry a little bit about getting that to work because of how the trees are updated, just the, the actual MCMC behind it. I don't know off the top of my head how you would abstract it enough to, to make it super modular. But again, I think this is an opportunity. I don't view this as a limitation. I think this is, maybe I speak loud enough, my graduate students will hear like, hey, this could be a super cool thesis idea. But in, in reality, this is something that as a community, we are going to have to face. Um, if we want BART to be you know, as easy to use, and I, and I use that word advisedly, as, as something like Stan. Yeah, that's why probabilistic languages like Stan, PyMC, and, and so on are, are so, so good because they allow people to focus on the code instead of having to write down the algorithms and then how to plug everything together, which is extremely complex. So yeah, yeah for sure. Like, so to you, that would be the main limitation for now of of uh, BART, like the most challenging part actually when working with BART would be the implementation. Yeah, I think that that's it. And, and there are some really nice user facing packages. I mean, if you're willing to use, if you're willing to use our Rob's BART package is really easy to use. Like I'm telling you, put your X's in a matrix, put your Y's in a vector, call BART X, Y, and you're in business. Like it, it really is not like, not hard to use. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's an ethos that's really spilled over to all of the subsequent developments of BART. You know, the folks who are writing new BART-based models and packaging them, they're making it easy to use, but it's that, you know, are we keeping up with all of the fancy models that people can dream up? That's, you know, we're, we're certainly behind there. Can you also put the, the link to that uh, package in the, in the show notes for listeners? So that's in R. Right. So that was actually going to be one of my questions. Uh, which package do you, do you use to run your BART models? So it seems like you, you answered already. So yeah, definitely put that in the, in the show notes. I tend to write my own and insofar as, so, so usually it's stuff in C++ that, that interfaces through something like RCPP, which is, you know, pretty well developed and, and mature. Every so often there'll be a make this run in Python and, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this. I just don't know the interfacing as much. And I think like a native Python implementation could be a little bit slow. Um, trees, to, to represent a tree in a lightweight fashion, you, it does help to have some of the structure that something like C or C++ gives you. you know, a tree is kind of like a linked list. and You don't want to like have lots of sequential memory for that. And once you get down to that level, I think writing all of the BART at a low level and then interfacing it at a higher level is probably the most, this is going to be the most successful. If I can ever figure out how to do interfacing with Python, I'll probably end up doing that. I, it's just not something I know how to do. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. We know how to do that. <laughs> so. Oh, excellent. Then I think, uh, yeah, then we should uh, chat offline about that. For sure, if you want to get in touch with uh, Osvaldo, like, I, I can yeah, definitely introduce, introduce you to him. He's, I know he's uh, way more knowledgeable than me on that, on that implementation stuff. Cool. So I have so many more questions because that these models are so cool. Uh, and I'm really glad that we're finally 
digging deep into these models. I really hope listeners also will appreciate that. But time is flying by, and I want to ask you also about some examples. So you talked about the fact that you worked a bit in like applications of base in sports, applications of base in, in public health. So could you take an example, basically, from your work to let us understand how you apply patient stats in those in those settings. It can be using BARTs or not. It's okay. Like for instance, you mentioned at the beginning of the episode that you were working on that study on how the on the impact of sports during adolescence later in life. Uh, that can be that or it can be something else. That study was something that I started when I was in graduate school and and a lot of the sort of from a technical perspective, it's very non Bayesian at first pass. It's a lot of propensity score estimation and matching and randomization inference, and sensitivity analysis, and sort of causal inference of a certain flavor. Where it gets interesting, though, and, and where I kind of jumped in to thinking more like a Bayesian was, often in these studies, we're, we're interested in studying the effects on multiple outcomes. And many variables, we might have lots of covariates and lots of, lots of Y dimensions. And so in my in in my PhD, I got really interested in the problem of like multiple or multivariate regression, where you have multiple outcomes, and thinking about that from a Bayesian standpoint, because you know it seems that I should be able to borrow strength from from one outcome and learn something about another if, if they're related. I should be able to leverage that dependence and setting up a model and and doing that, and and so that led to some methodological work on kind of estimating sparse you know multiple outcome models. Uh, to that, and, and then we've like gone back and reapplied those to verify the sort of results of our first study, and we sort of replicated it, um, which was nice. I think uh, more recently, I've started talking with some colleagues in demography, and they're interested in, you know, how do cognitive processes change over time, and and there we actually developed some BART models to to capture that sort of temporal dependence, because you know what my colleague had been doing was trying to you know just model the temporal evolution with like a linear term in, in time or a time and time squared. And that's only going to capture certain functional shapes. Um, it can't capture, you know, a process that sort of increases and then decreases, then increases again. Whereas a BART can pretty easily capture that, maybe not as smoothly, but certainly it can get the rough shape right. So we've been looking at that. We should have kind of a paper out about that at some point soon this year. And then in the sports world, I got really interested in graduate school and in, in modeling ball strike decisions in baseball, whether an umpire calls a pitch a ball or a strike. Mm -hmm. We initially back in, I would say, 2015, 2016, we tried to answer sort of the variability across umpires. You know, different umpires have different behaviors. Their decision making is 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 variable. So we set it up like, you know, after like a Bayes 101, we we had a logistic regression for every single umpire and we put the parameters, like we embedded them within sort of like an exchangeable model where we could borrow strength across umpires. And it just turned into this massive like logistic regression, you know, hundreds of equations, thousands of parameters, hundreds of thousands of data, set, uh, data points. And we tried fitting that in STAN back in like 2015 and 2016. So this was really early. So I got a chance to learn STAN pretty early on and play with these like large models that back in the day took like weeks to run because I didn't know about reparameterization and all of the cool tricks that, that they've developed. And so we wrote this paper about that. And, and that actually turned out kind of interestingly to have a pretty nice impact in baseball. There were a lot of people working at teams who kind of reached out afterwards saying, you know, we'd like to implement your model and was like get a supercomputer in, in a week and, and learn Stan and then you could do it. More recently, one of my students and I has have been revisiting that paper and using a BART instead of this like large parametric model. And we'll have the results of this out pretty soon, but using a BART just works so much better. We can get so much more accurate predictions. We avoid kind of a large, there's a sort of issue with categorical predictors that comes up um, that's in a sort of a recent preprint that, that we explore. It just works really well. We can get pretty accurate predictions of what umpires are doing. And this is something that, you know, somebody in baseball can train on their computer in a day or in a few hours. Yeah. It's not, you know, weeks or like a, a week on a supercomputer. So I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, it sounds like a different. And we've used some Bayesian thinking for like uh, 
for modeling the probability that a, like a wide receiver catches the football in, in American football. That also was, was work with, uh, with Kathy Evans, who's great, and uh, we, we presented it to the NFL and they kind of liked it. So it was kind of fun. Um, all done with some like patient thinking of all. Yeah. Do you have anything written about that that we can put into the show notes? Yeah, absolutely. I'll put links there. Awesome. Yeah. And these show notes are going to be full for this episode. Folks. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Yeah. I'm actually curious about that study you, you made about, you know, the, um, like the impact of the amount of sports you do as adolescent and the impact it has on your health later on. I'm curious, like, because it sounds to me that you would need longitudinal data to do that. So it takes a lot of time, right? Like, so did you do that or did you manage to find a way to not use longitudinal data? No, so we definitely use longitudinal data. And this is sort of a fundamental problem. If I want to know what's going to happen to kids who are playing football today, mm -hmm. I have to wait 30, 40, 50 years for them to age up. Yeah. The best thing I can do instead is study longitudinal data that was collected 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago mm -hmm. and form what's happening to people now um, who were, you know, in adolescence those many decades ago. And so a theme throughout this, this sort of area of our collaboration is leveraging longitudinal data sets that have already been collected, often to answer different questions, but usually they'll have some indication of sports participation and some indication of later life health outcomes. And if we're super lucky, they'll even have some measurements of potential mediators. Mm -hmm. And then we have to think hard about, you know, causal identification. Is this even a well-posed problem? And then there turns into a modeling problem that, you know, how it's wrong to think that these effects are constant over time. How do we estimate them flexibly? And, and that's where I start to think about using things like BART. And so one natural question is, how do we leverage BART to do longitudinal data or like streaming types of things or functional data? I mean, these are hard methods problems. That, that are growing out of a larger application. So I don't I don't have an answer for what's going to happen to kids who are playing, you know, American football today. Yeah. The science is still very much in progress. Yeah, I read the other day, but that, um, you know, that very long Harvard study that's been done by the psycho psychology department of Harvard. Like, I think they have started that in the 20, 1920s or something like that. So it's been running for basically a century. And so they have like this trove of longitudinal data. And I found that very interesting, like for a, for a statistician, that's just fascinating. <laughs> it's a gold mine. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely a gold mine. And so actually that makes me think about bots again and in relation to causal inference, because I know you work all, also a lot on causal inference. So yeah, basically, can you give us the rundown on if you're doing causal inference, can you use BART? Or do you have to be more careful? You should always be careful when you're doing causal inference. So the caveat would be you always have to be careful when you're using causal inference. I mean, when you want to make causal claims, right? If you're using linear regression, you have to be careful about what you're saying. But yeah, can you just tell us what you have to be careful in the thought framework? So there's a couple of things. In kind of the canonical causal settings, you've got a, a treatment, if you're willing to make the kind of usual assumptions at some level, you do have to fit a regression model. To the extent that BART is a very convenient off-the-shelf tool, go ahead and use it. So, so there's this wonderful paper by Jennifer Hill in, I think, 2011 that, that essentially does this. Mm -hmm. And then a follow-up, well, and, and sort of a philosophical follow-up by, by Richard Hahn and, and Jared Murray and Carlos Carvalho, they kind of reparameterize the sort of response surface as a sort of a prognostic function plus a, a treatment effect. Um, and they use BARTs to estimate both. And this is the Bayesian causal forest paradigm. And if you look at the kind of Atlantic causal inference or the American causal inference contests, some version of BART or this Bayesian causal forest generally does pretty well in these sort of data contests. And so it suggests to me that flexible regression models have a lot of utility if you're chasing, you know, heterogeneous treatment effects. You don't necessarily have to use BART. There's nothing inherently causal about BART. It's just a very flexible regression framework that happens to be super easy to use in certain settings. Mm -hmm. And so I will say that if you then do that, there has been some work that's, you know, less laudatory, like it is not as like, you know, BART's amazing and, and you should do it. There, it's, it's critical. When BART is unsure about its predictions, it 
when, when, when you're trying to extrapolate to regions that you don't see a lot of data in your training sample, BART's uncertainties can be a little bit, they may not behave the way you would like them to. BART might express some overconfidence and truly biased estimates. I think a good picture to have is imagine you have a Gaussian process and you try to evaluate the, like the, the realization from the GP well away from your training data. It's just flat. You know, your uncertainties are kind of flat. It's, you've reverted back to the prior. There's no sort of inflating of your variance bar. So you can't say that, oh, when your variance is inflated, you're extrapolating. Art has a similar type of pathology. And so it can lead in certain problems that if you just use BART out of the box and don't think about positivity or lack of overlap, you might end up with, you know, treatment effects and their uncertainties might really be understated than what you would like. You would like, you know, when, when the model really is extrapolating, you'd like to say, I've got tons of uncertainty. BART's uncertainties are sort of capped by the prior. And there's, there's sort of a nice analogy with GPs that I think you can make. Uh, think about what the uncertainty bands around a, a GP or prediction bands around a GP would be far from your training data. It'll look like a sort of a flat rectangle. So it's the usual caveats. Um, BART though can, it, at least my understanding is that it, it, it can be overconfident in places that it shouldn't be. But in places where you don't have a lot of data, I'm sorry, but like, what can we do here? Uh, Thinking about your priors <laughs> and your model structure. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that there's always good utility there. That's also why I'm like, that's what I'm telling people also with, when they're like, oh yeah, but why are prior useful, you know, stuff like that? Well, it's priors are useful for that. Like, especially if you don't have any data and you don't have any prior knowledge, how do you want to learn any, anything? <laughs> you're basically, I don't know, you're basically saying, I don't know anything and I don't have any more information than that. How do you want to make inferences based on that? If you want to make inferences sure, and you don't have a lot of data, then you need to go back and see if you have some prior knowledge or at least an idea of the story your model could say. I definitely agree with that sentiment. Cool. Okay. Thank you. So that's a trove of information here for our listeners. That's really cool. The show notes are going to be full, so I'm happy about that because listeners love them. Maybe before uh, asking you the last two questions, let me ask you, what does the future of Bayesian stats look like to you? And more specifically, what would you like to see and not see? I think the future of Bayesian stats is just super exciting. I think the envelope is getting pushed in so many different ways. And, you know, my own personal thing is I really want to get back to thinking about uncertainty quantification when in, in these kind of like spike and slap models, these, these sort of like very, dis, there's like a very discrete space that we're interested in. And we see it through kind of a manifestation of like a continuous space. I don't know how to do uncertainty quantification there very well. That's something that I would most like to learn and, and thinking hard. I think there's a lot of work that, you know, looks at things like the Bayesian bootstrap or weighted likelihood bootstrap. Certainly some of my colleagues here at Wisconsin are very into this. And that's something that I really am. I think this idea of like, can we be clever about optimization to somehow approximate the samples from the posterior, not, you know, approximation of the posterior, but the, the, the actual posterior we write down. I think that would be just totally cool. But that's a very like idiosyncratic uh, answer to your question. That was kind of like an question, a very broad question. So I like that. And so I'm curious, you, you do a lot of things. So I just want to ask you, what's the next thing that you want to learn? Oh, it can be not non stats related. Oh, well, now let's keep it in stats. There's plenty in statistics that I want to learn. You know, from talking to a lot of my colleagues here, I've gotten really interested in, in sort of random graphs and, and networks. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to learn more about that. Um, and I've been learning a lot from them already, but I, I kind of want to Start thinking about that and, and, and thinking about, you know, where, you know, potentially some like ideas from Bayesian on parametrics or could we use BART to estimate a graph on? I think that's something a colleague of mine asked me a few days ago. And I think the answer is probably yes, but maybe I need to think about this more. Perfect. Well, Samir, is there um, one question that you wish I had asked you? but uh, didn't because I'm a very poor interviewer. No, no, this was great. You're excellent. I mean, come on. I don't, I don't have any questions that I like, wish you would ask me or anything like that. Cool. Okay. Well, that means we've, we've been, we've had a broad conversation. That's cool. 
Well, before letting you go, though, you know that I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask you for a guest at the end of the show. And so you are the 18th sample. So, you know, hopefully we'll get to the 4,000 samples. And then that means I'm going to be able to gather all of you guys into an inference data object and save all of your answers in a, in a net CDF file. Oh, wonderful. Oh, my God. These jokes are extremely nerdy. <laughs> Uh, so, here for them. <laughs> so, yeah, first question, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I mean, broadly, I want to get, to, I really want to understand approximation error when we're thinking about our posterior. Like, no matter what we do, we are just approximating it. And I think understanding that error in terms of, you know, how it manifests and like, you know, the approximation error for like a posterior mean or a posterior variance. And and I will say there's a lot of like very exciting work that's already being done on this. But if I had the like time and resources, I would really spend a lot of time trying to think about that. You know, you do you do some approximate inference procedure. Gosh, it'd be great if I can if we can get a guarantee in finite samples in metrizes things like, you know, means and variances or quantiles or things of that nature. And second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? So I'll be greedy, and I'll give you four answers here. Who? So one, unfortunately, they're all, they've all passed, um, but I would absolutely love to, to, to have dinner with, uh, with George Box um, you know, here in Wisconsin. He was our founding, founding member of our department, and the ethos that he set really does you know, come through even to this day. So I, I would just be fascinating to, to learn from him. I think it would be you know, absolutely phenomenal to sit down with Dennis Lindley and, and some of his writing and, and some of uh, Jimmy Savage's writing has been really influential in, in how I think and, and how I teach Bayes. And the last one, which is maybe more kind of personal, is my advisor was was Ed George and, and one of his advisors was was Charles Stein. And Stein, unfortunately, passed when I was uh, when I was a graduate student at a time when I was really interested in thinking about shrinkage estimation. And, and it's something that I wish... I, you know, to, to have met or to, to, to have interacted with him is, is something that I wasn't lucky enough to be able to do, but I've um, sort of would have loved to sit down and have a dinner with, I guess, my, what would be my, my academic grandfather. That's, there's four for you. Nice. Yeah. Well, that definitely sounds like a very nice dinner. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks a lot, Samir. That was really great. Um, I'm really happy that we could dive deep into bots and I hope that, uh, we gave people some curiosity and now everyone, everybody want to try, want to try bots. Again, yeah, if you are curious about all these topics, folks, there are a ton of show notes for this episode. So go to the episodes page on the Learn Based Science website and you will get all the show notes. As usual, thank you again, Samir, for taking the time and being on this show. Thanks for having me. This has been another episode of Learning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.